Good evening, and welcome again to Public Perspective. I'm your host, Kevin McDermott. And for those of you who may be familiar with the old adage, those who don't study history are doomed to repeat it, tonight we're going to talk about history in a very different context. Our guest tonight is the president of Don't Know Much About History, Mr. Phil Loricelli. Phil, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Well, let's start with some basic stuff. What is the company? It, in fact, it is a, a for-profit company, but uh, what's it all about? What is Don't Know Much About History? Don't Know Much About History was a startup in order to bring living history into classrooms throughout the area. While most students and teachers do a really good job in history, they don't have the time, especially the teachers. Um, the time for what? I mean, they, they teach history. So they teach is... history, but they, they can't really get through it. Uh, they can't get into the minutiae of it. They cover names and dates and places, but there's no real live person involved. And in order to bring it alive to them, to show students that these are people just like they are, who lived real, real normal real lives, lives right? then they need to see them and they need to experience them. And this was an idea that was just sprung out and we said, let's give this a try. So the, 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 ob object, excuse me, the object of this is to bring the history to life in, in, in a, a kind of reenactment? Is that uh, what you do when you bring it into the classrooms? Is there sort of a, a stage play, or how does this work? In a sense. Um, Don't Know Much About History is a cooperative effort between multiple performers who come out, and everybody has their own different style. Uh, my style is what we call first person, where I actually physically become the person. Uh, others uh, produce in third person, which is more or less a museum walk, uh, here's an artifact, here's how this artifact works, here's how it relates to what you're studying. And we try not to limit our presenters in any way, shape, or form. We let them feel free to do what they do, and hopefully the students, the teachers, and even adult audiences come away with a little more knowledge than they had before. Now, what I think is interesting, we were talking before the show, and you are not a historian by trade. And, in fact, professionally, you started out much differently from this. So how did you come to do history? Well, basically, um, my degree is in corporation finance. Um, I was 25 years as a corporate credit manager. And one day during a former recession, um, the door closed, and I found myself looking for something to do. I'd always loved history. Um, every war movie, John Wayne movie, historical documentary, anything I could get my hands on, I watched. Um, I liked the touch and the feel of artifacts. And so I decided that at that time, I would take a leap, and I would open a store in Geneva, which was called Don't Know Much About History. It was a history store, and it had everything from art and murals and toy soldiering and uniforms and artifacts that people could come in and purchase and bring back to their homes and, and set up and use in that way. Uh, the store lasted about 10 years, and it folded in a sense because this presentation, this living history, really started to take off. Um, it so was rather, a than have, rather than have people come in and just simply browse and see it, mm -hmm. you essentially took the history out to them instead. Exactly. Uh, teachers would come in, and they'd say, boy, we really wish we could have somebody come to the classroom and speak. And then the hand went up, and I said, I can do that. And we started to build on this. And at first, it was mainly the American Civil War, because that was my major interest at the time. But since it has branched out, um, we've done the American Revolution, we've done Second World War, we have done... Uh, Korean War, we do a program called War Letters, uh, which recently was shown live at Cantini for the Veterans uh, Day mm -hmm. programs. Um, some of our people also do medieval, and uh, that, that's very interesting. But you would not consider yourself, or maybe you would, uh, would you consider yourself and, and your group reenactors in the sense that, that we see where people will go out and reenact a particular battle of the Civil War or the Revolutionary War? Is that a, a description that fits your group? I think that we are presenters who are also reenactors. Um, reenacting is a very personal, self-absorbed profession. Um, most people who do reenacting are not there for the crowds. They're there because they want to learn something. They want to live mm -hmm. that time. They want to understand the people who went through it. That a crowd is there and is viewing them is secondary to the point. Whereas living history presenters are there to play to the people, to try and get a point directly mm -hmm. across to them. Um, my doing Jefferson is, is a perfect point in view. We want people to understand Thomas Jefferson. And as I try to explain to most people, uh, especially schools, that the Thomas Jefferson I portray is the actual Thomas Jefferson, not somebody who was on Liberty's Kids cartoon show. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was the Abby Hoffman of the 1700s. 
He was a radical. He was, he was a wild guy. Radical. And yet today we revere him as one of the founders of the country. We've, we've lost sight that you can have divergence point of view, and yet we can still come together as a country and work together. And I'll, I'll come back to Jefferson in, in a moment, but I, j I just wanted to point out that I think with our, our opening shot here, mm -hmm. if people were wondering what it is that's hanging behind you, oh. that is in fact uh, your Jefferson outfit, right? This is what is called a great coat. Uh, the great coat was the standard dress, like a businessman's coat today, that any gentleman would have worn. Uh, it was personally crafted. Most gentlemen had two. Uh, they wore them until they were dirty, and then they were cleaned. It didn't matter if they were threadbare, just so long as they were clean. Uh, and most gentlemen would dress in this manner with a waistcoat. Um, a gentleman wore a blouse. He didn't wear a shirt. He wore a blouse. Uh, he wore breached trousers, um, what today would be called knickers, mm -hmm. uh, silk hosiery, and buckle shoes. Uh, for the most part, most Americans didn't wear a wig. And, and I would think that the, the wardrobe was actually very limited. Uh, people in that era didn't own a lot of clothes, I would guess. Right, exactly. The reason for it, for so many layers, is layering. They didn't have central heating, as we know it today. And so you put on when you were cold, and you took off when you were warm. And so it was a very useful system for them. Gee, something we might take a lesson from even today in exactly. the age of energy conservation, just to put on another layer. Exactly. Uh, so, just to, uh, when you get these clothes, you mentioned that in the time period you're representing, these were custom made. So, as a as someone who presents this in living history, I mean, how do you get these clothes? Do you find them? You wouldn't go down to Walmart and find that hanging on the rack. No, certainly. not at all. Um, there are corporations, what which we call sutlers, who do produce different period style clothing. Um, in this case, in this jacket, this was homemade. Uh, this was made in my home and. Mm -hmm. Uh, most of my equipment is homemade because it would have been homemade during that time. Hmm. Uh, there weren't department stores. You couldn't go and buy a suit off the rack. You had to be tailored for it, and it cost a lot of money. So basically every gentleman could afford these things. The common people would buy homespun, and the homespun would be cut into something that they could wear on a daily basis. So let's talk, go back to the, the subject of Jefferson himself. And, and you mentioned that, that he was quite a, a radical, the Abby Hoffman of, of his day. And uh, it, it's, I think it's true, something we lose sight of in the course of uh, looking at history, that um, most, in fact, revolutions are, are never started by conservative people. It's always the wild-eyed guys who feel we're going to make a, a, a radical break with what's happened and we're going to do something entirely different. Um, and as you say, later they become revered as the founding fathers and they're wonderful and they represent all of the virtues of the country but they were revolutionaries in every sense they wanted to upend and overthrow the existing order so how do you bring that about when you're portraying Jefferson how do you get that message across to your audiences most of the time it is through things that will shock them such um, as for example um, the Pledge of Allegiance today uh, it was instituted in the early 1900s, and it flowed through, and things were added to it in the interim. But Jefferson, through reading his works, would never have approved of a Pledge of Allegiance. And why not? Because a pledge is an oath. It's a ritual. If you don't believe in the ritual, well, then it's absolutely meaningless to you. And for Jefferson's part, he believed in a total separation between the church and the state. Uh, he wrote that to the Danbury Baptists in 1803. Um, he liked a little revolution now and then. If we had taken an oath of allegiance to George III, would that have stopped us from dumping the tea into Boston Harbor or firing the shots at Lexington and Concord? Of course it wouldn't. So well, some people it, it would have, but... It, it's a ritual. But, it, it's mm -hmm. a meaningless concept to him. Um, plus, we use certain things like one nation indivisible. In his eyes, that was a scandalous thing. And in fact, we were a very divided nation during the Civil War and have been at various other times. Well, not quite that seriously. But yes, indivisibil indivisibility is something that was not taken for granted at all until after the Civil War. Exactly. Um, and during Jefferson's own time as president, today we, we consider ourselves red states or blue states. Well, back then there was just as much sectionalism between the Democratic Republican South and the Federalist North. And there was talk of secession even during Jefferson's time. Uh, in fact, when Jefferson was somewhat elected president, because he had to go through 36 votes in Congress in order to elect him, uh, the governors of Pennsylvania and Virginia were more organizing the militias to march into Washington to take the election for Jefferson. So if we think today that our elections are somewhat Raucous. volatile, they're nowhere near what Mr. Jefferson went through. 
And in fact, if we think about what, the way Congress operated, uh, you know, we think about the gridlock in Congress and the lack of respect and the people don't work together. But 100 years ago or 150 or 200 years ago, uh, Congress was a pretty wild place, was exactly. it not? Exactly. The, um, the House of Representatives was meant by the Founding Fathers to take on the oddities and the eccentricities of the people. It was very close to the people, which exactly is what is happening today. Whereas the Senate was the second secretion of the national will. It was more refined. It was more stable. And so you went through the law at the House of Representatives level, and it came out a little bit crazy. And then it removed to the Senate, and the Senate refined it and distilled it down to what law they thought should be. And then the senators, I think many Americans may still not know that senators were not always popularly elected. They oh. were appointed by the state legislatures. Exactly. Uh, the House of Representatives was elected by the popular vote of the constituency. The Senate was elected by the legislature of the state in which the senators would come from. And so therefore it was a, a level that removed itself from the people. Um, it, was, it was thought that the people couldn't be trusted. Jefferson thought the opposite. He was the opposite of his antithesis, Alexander Hamilton, who, although born a illegitimate child in the Bahamas, came to represent the ruling class, the high, the well-born, the elite, whereas Jefferson, a pseudo-aristocrat, tended to throw him his lot with the people. He trusted the people. And because of this, you have two divergent groups totally splitting, the Federalists under Hamilton, the Democratic Republicans under Jefferson, and frankly, they hated each other. And so how do we see that play out in today? One of the things I think that's most interesting about history, and the fact that if you don't study it, you're doomed to repeat it, how does that play out today? I mean, today we see, the, uh, in my mind, a somewhat similar uh, division between the, the, those who represent the interests of the wealthy and the elite mm -hmm. and those who, who say they represent the interests of the rest of America. There's the 1%, the 99%. There's a lot of different ways of looking at it. But are these carryovers, are these recurrences of the themes? Oh, yes. I mean, it, it's very constant throughout American history. Um, you had, obviously, the Democratic Republicans and the Federalists in that time, which then became the Whigs and the Democrats during the middle years of the 1800s, which finally gave way to the black Republicans under Lincoln against the Democrats. Who were the, the conservatives of the time. Right? And the power base shifted from the North to the South on one party and the South to the North on the other party. Then after the war, the Southern states became solidly Democratic and the Northern states were solidly Republican. And today, it is exactly the, the opposite. opposite. So the polls switch on occasion. And it's just a matter of things. Um, so what I think is interesting about that is that uh, people then, uh, particularly today, come to identify parties as, as embodying certain ideas and mm -hmm. certain uh, virtues or ideologies. And in fact, in, throughout history, that's not necessarily true. The ideologies may exist throughout centuries, but as you say, they shift, they move from party to party. Um, is, that a, um, is that uniquely American, or do we see that in other countries? Well, you see it in other countries. You definitely see it in other countries. Um, but not as radically as here, because we're holding to the people here. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's a rich person, a poor person, or a person in the middle. Everyone has their own idea, and given the freedoms that we earned by inherent design, they were not given to us by the government. They were not promoted by the government. They were given to us as inherent natural right. Well, we, we the people, claimed those rights, not asking them to be given. We exactly. asserted the rights existed. Government doesn't give you rights. That, well, rights are given you. Certainly the American position is, is exactly. that. Right. That gives every man a say in the government. And when every man is enveloped in the government, the government performs the way people want them to. Unfortunately, we've become so polarized today um, that that has started to move away. It's almost like a quantum shift. Um, we've, we've got two parties who have divergent views of what, the way the nation should be going. And the role and, of government. And figure. they won't talk to each other. The role of government is a very simple one. The role of government is to, especially the federal government, is to handle foreign affairs. The federal government, in the eyes of the founders, and even through Mr. Lincoln's own time, before Mr. Lincoln became a stolid federalist, were basically that the states had the rights and the states were to take care of the people. The federal government was to handle foreign affairs. But wasn't the federal government also sort of the, the arbiter among states that, uh, and we saw this I think later manifested in the interstate commerce mm -hmm. uh, laws, 
where the federal government stepped in to say, well, look, we're, we're going to make some continuity here so that these states can actually operate with each other. Um, as many students may not know, I mean, originally each state had its own currency, for mm -hmm. example. Um, and that, that made trade and interaction much harder. So was the original idea of the federal government to help facilitate that as well, or are those later developments? They're later developments, because even though Congress might pass a law on the federal level, until the time of the American Civil War, states were free to ignore those laws. They could choose to ignore it or choose to accept it in any way that, cho that they wanted to. And so the theory of nullification came about. Um, it was produced... Nullification meaning to ignore we could a law. Nullify, nullify the law right. in our state. We don't have to listen to it. And all of this was the fault of the American Supreme Court. Uh, this came about during Jefferson's term under a decision called Marbury versus Madison. In, it's a very... It's a famous case. It's famous, but it's, it's, it's not really an important case. The case was basically about judicial appointments, that Jefferson refused to honor Adams' judicial appointments because Adams made them at the 11th hour, hoping to fill the judgeships with people that were close to him. And Jefferson ignored this, and he ordered uh, James Madison not to deliver the commissions, which they were then sued for. But the most important thing that came out of the case was not whether a judge was going to be seated. It was basically at the end when John Marshall said that the Supreme Court has the right to review all laws to decide whether they are constitutional or not. It's not ensconded in the Constitution. You can read the Constitution. There's no judicial review mentioned. John Marshall was the progenitor of this law, of this custom. He got it from English common law and from other codes and said that because we are a country that follows mainly the English law, therefore the Supreme Court has this right. Well, today it's... Now, in, in the original framers' mind, though, um, the Supreme Court, what was their role? Simply to hear cases that couldn't be decided or that were still disputed at some lower level? And did they have the ability to overrule state courts in the early days? They did. They were the final court. They were not there to pronounce basic law uh, like we do today, where a law will pass Congress and then the Supreme Court will look at it if it's been challenged. Basically, if you were to sue me or the president were to sue a stevedore, um, it would go through the courts and wind up in the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court's decision was final. That's why the Supreme Court existed. And the problem with the Supreme Court then, as is now, is that they serve for life, and they're beholden to no one. Well, that also would be seen as one of the advantages of the court, that they're, they're not swayed by political influence, or at least in theory. Mm -hmm. They're not swayed by any kind of popular opinion or political influence because they don't have to worry about re-election, they don't have to worry about reappointment, that they, they feel secure. Um, but I will also say that, uh, as I understand it, the Supreme Court justices were generally appointed very late in life, mm -hmm. and they didn't serve very long. Ten, twelve years was about the limit, which we don't see today. No. Right? Um, if, you were if you were appointed to the Supreme Court in Jefferson or even Lincoln's time and you were 40, you might live 10 years and then you would be replaced. Today, if you're 40, you might live to be 90. And unless you step down, there's almost no way to remove a Supreme Court justice. What, what is more like a king on a throne than a Supreme Court justice sitting on his court, appointed not by the people but by representatives, and beholden to no one and cannot be removed from office? Well, at least there are nine of them, so there's not one person making And the nine make decision. law, in essence, for 300 million. Uh, it, it seems that term limits on the Supreme Court are called for, as long as, as every other office should be. So now when you go out to the schools and, and you uh, do this reenactment, so that, uh, the, the, the idea of term limits on the Supreme Court, it clearly is, is an opinion that, that you mm -hmm. hold. Um, do it, you it's Jefferson's opinion, too. Oh, really? Yes. Jefferson wrote in his Notes on the State of Virginia that all offices should have term limits. He quoted... Roman history, uh, Cincinnatus, who was appointed dictator when the barbarians came to Rome. He put down his plow, picked up his sword, fulfilled his office, and then resigned the office and returned to his fields. This is what everybody supposed that the government should be like. This is what the Founding Fathers insisted the government be like. But it became corrupted as it moved along. Um, it followed the English system, where corruption is the movement in the English system. Um, when it's corrupt, it serves the people because then the highest bidder gets to take care of the people. So if we think about 
term limits, though. The, the argument against term limits is that uh, there is a, a, a you know, large uh, government bureaucracy at every level, the, mm -hmm. from the smallest suburban village up to the federal government, uh, and that if the elected officials have narrow term limits, so for example, two terms for House of Representatives would only be four years, uh, that the real power would reside then with the bureaucrats rather than with the elected officials because you'd never have enough time to master what was going on in an organization as complex as, say, the federal government. So that by allowing or not allowing term limits, that the, the representatives have time to really understand the machinations of government, to build the ability to move this Leviathan around, and that they would lose all that if they could only serve for six years. The problem with that is that the representatives become stagnant. When you have served 30 years in the House of Representatives, you are so far removed from the people. You, you have a small group of people who influence you, who are always there for you, and you return to your district occasionally to talk to people, but you're not with your people. And because of that, then you start to think that your law and what you think is the will of the people rather than the will of the people speaking to you. It is important that in Jefferson's time and in other politicians' time throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, the will of the people was important. As Jefferson once said, we do not have the rule of the majority in this country. We have the rule of the majority of the people who participate. And that was important because if, for say, you were in Congress and a bill came up to stimulate the economy and it was going to cost billions of dollars, well, you were there to represent your constituents. So you would return to your constituency, you would hold a poll, and your constituency would tell you yes or no, and you would go back to Congress and you would vote the will of the people. Now today, the Congress goes and says, well, I'm here to represent the people, and personally, I think this will or this will not work, and I'm going to vote my conscience. It's a very dangerous thing. Um, Is this why we spend so much time in American politics today focusing on the character of the candidates? Because we know that they vote what they call their conscience, and we want to know what their real feelings are and who they are as a person, and what kind of character they represent? I think so. And I think it's, it's an outgrowth of prior American history. Um, if you look at it, it was written, uh, Jefferson wrote this also, that there needs to be a high wall of separation between a person's personal life and a public life. They should not be combined. You should not look at them. Now, today we judge people by their past history. So we get an idea of how we think they're going to react when they go into a situation like that. Unfortunately, that's not always the truth. It's not always what we expect. And well, in fact, presidents are frequently surprised by their own Supreme Court choices exactly. um, who turn out to be quite different from what they expected when they appointed them. And we've just been through a major you know, presidential election. We've taken two and a half years <clears throat> and spent billions of dollars to distill down the two most able candidates able to run for that office? Well, the reason is basically that these are the people who are willing to have their lives looked at. With unbelievable scrutiny and detail. Exactly. Right? Nothing is hidden in the end. Exactly. Think of if you were running for a public office, the one thing that you would not want known on Larry King Live, knowing that it was going to come out. It'll be there, right. Most rational people would say, I'm And in fact, not many people do, do, in fact, bow out of public service for that very reason. Exactly. So how would we change that today? Uh, how could we get back, or should we even get back, to uh, a, the, the situation you described where a representative would go back and poll the people, especially now given that a, a, a member of the House of Representatives typically now represents, what, I think 800,000 800, uh, people. So um, how do you get the feeling from 800,000 people? You can't just knock on doors or pick up the phone. Well, see, it's impossible for an individual, individual representative to do that. That's why they have large staffs. But the large staffs are more concerned with administrative work than they are with touching hands with the people. Um, I know that in my district out here in western Illinois, um, I don't think I've ever seen anyone from my representative's office ever call on my home, knock on the door and say, hey, look, we've got something going, or call me and say, we need your opinion on something. Could we use technology today with social media and the Internet? I think it's coming. I think that this is something that Jefferson certainly would have approved of. Think about this. Um, we are no longer a democracy. We're a, re we're a republic. 
We are a representative republic. Democracy ended a long time ago, but we can get back to the true Greek ideal where of every, democracy. Where everyone votes on is the issues at hand. And we have the means. We have the internet now. And I know that the internet now is known mainly for its deficiencies and its lack of security, but those situations can be resolved. And some evening, sitting in your home, the president may come on the television and say, uh, we would like to get the opinion of the populace. Uh, we find it necessary to invade Canada. Please go to your computers and cast your vote as to whether we should do this or not. Of course, being a technologist myself, which is my professional background, um, and having spent many years in the uh, uh, elections arena, um, I would say that uh, voting via the internet is probably, is, to my mind, the end of democracy because I don't think you could ever protect it from hacking. But that's a story, mm -hmm. that's a topic for another show altogether. Let me come back to, because um, we only have a, a few minutes left, I want to come back to what you do with the schools and how a school would, if they wanted you to come in and, pre and represent uh, Jefferson or, or do a debate, as I know you mm -hmm. did earlier tonight, um, against uh, uh, an Abe Lincoln figure. Um, how would a school contact you and what would they do to, to talk with you? And well, basically, uh, we have a website. It's www.ushistoryrocks.org. Yeah, I think we've been showing that throughout okay. the show. So. Um, my telephone number is available through the website. Mm -hmm. uh, email is available through the website. And we encourage the teacher or the representative of the school to call us. Because they can, can they work with you on the content and what oh, they want definitely. to present? So it's all tailor-made for the individual If school, they happen right? to be studying a certain portion of the American Civil War, we may have a representative who can explain that in greater detail. Um, they can do single presenter. They can do a half-day group presentation. They can do a full-day group presentation. Um, we tend to do these things in a round-robin setup whereby each presenter does three at least hour-long presentations uh, to the students and the students rotate between each of these stations so that they're constantly moving, we're not. But they get a little history on both sides. Um, if we're talking the Civil War, we'll have both a Union and, and a Confederate soldier. And do the kids love it? Oh my gosh, yes. Um, well, on that note then, we're out of time. Oh. So um, history has continued past as we've been talking. So we'll have to come back and talk. Thank you so much for coming and joining us. I appreciate the time. It's a wonderful subject, and I hope you'll come back and talk to us further in the future. Thank you. I'd love to. And thank you for joining us once again on Public Perspective. I'm your host, Kevin McDermott. You can see us every Saturday night on Comcast Channel 19 at 8 o'clock, or you can find us on the web at publicperspective.tv. So until next time, thank you and good night.